Summary of Chapter 11 Asking for an Extended Leave for a Family Issue by Denise M. Rousseau This chapter discusses the process of requesting extended leave from work for personal or family reasons. It outlines the preparation, negotiation, and implementation phases of the leave request, emphasizing the importance of understanding company policies and culture. The document provides guidance on framing the request, managing relationships with superiors and colleagues, and preparing for re-entry after the leave. It also addresses unexpected leave requests and offers strategies for handling potential denials. The overall focus is on problem-solving and negotiation to achieve a successful leave arrangement. When negotiating an extended leave for a family issue, it's crucial to consider the impact on your coworkers and boss. Here are some steps to reduce the burdens on them. 1. Plan ahead. If possible, provide advance notice of your need for leave. Creating a window of opportunity for planning and adjusting helps make problem-solving easier and allows your team to prepare for your absence. 2. Consider work coverage. Discuss with your boss and colleagues how your work will be covered in your absence. Identify tasks that can be finished before your leave, postpone non-urgent work, and brainstorm ideas with your coworkers to pick up the slack. 3. Communicate clearly. Work with your manager on a communication plan. Figure out what you and your boss are going to say to others regarding your leave and who needs to know what when. If you have agreed to remain accessible to coworkers in need of your support while you are away, explain how this should happen. 4. Seek win-win solutions. When negotiating with your boss, adopt a problem-solving approach. Propose solutions that benefit both you and the organization, and demonstrate your commitment to the company in the long term. 5. Document agreements. Keep a written record of your agreements with your boss. Summarize the details of your leave arrangement in an email and ask for confirmation to ensure mutual understanding. By taking these steps, you can help minimize the disruptions caused by your extended leave and maintain positive relationships with your coworkers and boss. Managing the message and keeping a written record when asking for an extended leave involves clear communication and documentation. Here's how you can manage the message and maintain a written record. Managing the message. 1. Communication plan. Work with your manager on a communication plan. Determine what information needs to be shared with others regarding your leave and who needs to be informed. 2. Time frame. Clearly communicate the time frame of your leave. If the duration is clear, convey this information to relevant parties. 3. Accessibility. If you have agreed to remain accessible to coworkers in need of your support while you are away, explain how this should happen. Specify preferred communication channels and the hours you anticipate being more available. Keeping a written record. 1. Summarize agreements. After discussions with your boss, summarize the details of your leave arrangement in an email. Include key points such as the duration of the leave, communication expectations, and any specific agreements made. 2. Confirmation. Request confirmation from your boss to ensure mutual understanding. Ask them to indicate if they have any corrections or clarifications to the summarized agreement. 3. Documentation. Maintain a written record of all communications related to your leave request. This includes emails, agreements, and any official documentation provided by your employer. By managing the message effectively and maintaining a written record of your leave discussions, you can ensure clarity, understanding, and documentation of the agreed-upon terms. Summary of Chapter 12. How to Negotiate with Your Kids, by Mary C. Kern and Terry R. Kurtzberg. This chapter provides insights on negotiating with children. It emphasizes the importance of preparing for negotiations, asking questions, and presenting ideas in ways that appeal to children. The text highlights the challenges parents face in these negotiations, such as dealing with emotions, repetitive arguments, and lack of preparation. It also offers strategies for effective negotiation, including prioritizing goals, using the right approach at the right time, and asking questions to understand children's perspectives. The document draws parallels between negotiating with children and professional negotiations, aiming to help parents navigate difficult moments and model effective problem-solving skills. The author outlines three main challenges of negotiating with children at home. 1. Emotion. 
children often use different tools such as guilt trips, meltdowns, and playing one parent off the other. Parents also tend to act and react in more extreme ways than they would in a professional setting. 2. Repetition. Negotiations at home, such as bedtime, screen time, and mealtime, tend to occur repeatedly, leading to patterns and ruts in the ways parents respond. 3. Preparation. Negotiations with children are oftentimes unannounced and over everyday things like chores and dessert, leading to a lack of preparation compared to professional negotiations. Understanding and addressing these challenges can help parents navigate negotiations with their children more effectively. To navigate tough discussions with family members, several strategies can be employed. 1. Preparation. Anticipate the discussion and prepare psychologically. Understand what you want to accomplish and see reaching your overarching goal as a problem to be solved. 2. Emotion management. Stay focused on the problem and avoid getting sidetracked by interpersonal dynamics. This can help in managing emotions and keeping discussions productive. 3. Asking questions. Similar to professional negotiations, asking questions to fill in the gaps and understand the perspectives of family members can be beneficial. 4. Presenting ideas. Craft statements in a way that paves the way toward acceptance. How you present your ideas can significantly impact the outcome of the discussion. 5. Understanding fairness. Address fairness and recognize that fairness is not always based on everything being exactly equal. Highlight reference points and consider offers in comparison to other alternatives. By employing these strategies, individuals can navigate tough discussions with family members more effectively, leading to better outcomes and strengthened relationships. Summary of Chapter 13. Help Your Partner Cope with Work Stress, by Rebecca Knight. This chapter provides advice on supporting a partner dealing with work-related stress. It emphasizes the importance of active listening, showing empathy, and avoiding comparisons. The text suggests creating a supportive home environment, encouraging outside friendships, and helping the partner develop an end-of-work routine. It also highlights the significance of distinguishing between sporadic and chronic stress and offers guidance on asking probing questions and providing gentle advice. The document underscores the idea of managing stress together as partners and creating a haven at home. To help your partner cope with work stress, it's important to provide your undivided attention when they need to talk. Actively listen and show empathy without being competitive or dismissive of their stress. Encourage open communication and ask probing questions to help them reflect on their situation. Additionally, create a supportive home environment, encourage outside friendships and interests, and help your partner develop an end-of-work routine to decompress. It's also essential to distinguish between sporadic and chronic stress and offer gentle advice when needed. Lastly, manage stress together as partners and create a haven at home. Sporadic stress is characterized by occasional, short-term stress resulting from specific events, such as a bad meeting or a project gone awry. On the other hand, chronic stress is persistent and long-lasting, often bubbling under the surface for an extended period. To address sporadic stress, it's important to offer support, listen actively, and provide gentle advice when needed. For chronic stress, it's crucial to notice your partner's attitude, mood, and patterns, and help them reflect on their career and professional path. Encourage open communication and create a supportive environment to address both types of stress effectively.
Summary of Chapter 14 What You Should Tell Your Kids About Finding a Career by James M. Citrin At this chapter, author provides advice for parents on guiding their children in finding a career. It emphasizes the importance of helping kids discover their strengths, learn marketable skills, and understand the trade-offs between job satisfaction, lifestyle, and money. The document also highlights the significance of developing a reputation, making meaningful contributions, and cultivating a relationship mindset in the workforce. It advises parents to encourage their children to focus on potential, recognize the value of relationships, and navigate the early stages of their careers. In the early stages of their career, you should encourage your kids to focus on what is referred to as the aspiration phase. This phase is about exercising their intellectual and interpersonal energies, bringing enthusiasm, work ethic, and energy to an organization. It's a time for discovery, learning, and the development of knowledge, where they will be valued more for their potential than for their experience and track record. This chapter also document outlines three inevitable trade-offs that a college graduate may have to make when choosing a career path. 1. Job satisfaction. This encompasses the inherent quality of the work, the impact of the role, the level of autonomy, and the intrinsic satisfaction derived from the job itself. 2. Lifestyle. This includes factors such as the location of work, working hours, control over their schedule, commuting, and general working conditions. 3. Money. This involves the base salary, bonus potential, and possibly equity or long-term compensation. Understanding these trade-offs can help guide college graduates to career paths that align with their preferences and priorities. To help your kids cultivate a relationship mindset for their careers, you can encourage them to focus on developing meaningful connections and interactions in the professional world. This involves 1. Emphasizing the value of relationships. Encourage your kids to recognize the importance of building and maintaining professional relationships. Highlight the impact of positive interactions and connections in the workplace. 2. Politeness and professionalism. Stress the significance of being polite and professional in all professional interactions, regardless of the role or seniority of the individuals involved. 3. Follow up and gratitude. Advise them to follow up on introductions and express gratitude through thank you emails. These small gestures can leave a lasting positive impression. By guiding your kids to prioritize relationships and professional interactions, you can help them develop a relationship mindset that is essential for their career growth and overall success. Summary of Chapter 15. How to Talk to Yourself with Compassion, by Alice Boys. This chapter provides strategies for self-compassionate self-talk. Here is a summary of the key points. Key strategies for self-compassionate self-talk. 1. Identify needs in the moment. Give yourself a gentle nudge by asking, what do I need right now? Use self-talk to manage worry or encourage discipline as needed. 2. Challenge beliefs irreverently. Address self-doubt humorously to gain a realistic perspective of your abilities and achievements. 3. Reframe traits and tendencies. For perfectionists, understand that initial imperfections are normal and use self-compassion to maintain a balanced view of your capabilities. 4. Understand self-sabotaging patterns. Recognize and address patterns that cause stress or anxiety, using self-compassion to make better choices. 5. Borrow soothing language from others. Use comforting phrases from friends, mentors, or proverbs in your self-talk to manage perfectionism and control tendencies. 6. Plan ahead. Develop scripts for common scenarios where self-compassionate talk can help, such as dealing with new people or recognizing when perfectionism is affecting others. 7. Ask for help. Seek assistance from therapists or mentors to create effective self-compassionate responses for personal triggers. Common misconceptions are Self-compassionate talk is not overly sentimental. It should be genuine and in your natural tone. It's not a standalone solution. Combine it with other strategies like project management to tackle difficult tasks. Requires pre-planning. If you're not naturally compassionate in your self-talk, 
make specific plans for how to respond to common triggers. Not just positive thinking, acknowledge your emotions and difficulties, and then devise a kind action plan. Modeling self-compassion for children, for younger children, demonstrate handling difficult emotions and setbacks through verbalized strategies and acceptance of imperfections. For teenagers, share personal experiences of persistence and group work challenges to normalize these emotions and show resilience. And to conclude this chapter, practicing self-compassionate self-talk helps in personal and professional scenarios. It's about building personalized, kind habits to manage emotions and decisions effectively. This chapter emphasizes the importance of treating oneself with the same compassion one would offer a friend, using realistic, supportive self-talk to navigate life's challenges. Summary of Chapter 16, titled, Make Peace with Your Inner Critic, features an interview with Tara Moore, conducted by Sarah Green Carmichael, and focuses on managing self-doubt and the inner critic. Key points and strategies in this sections are. 1. Desire for praise. Moore discusses how reliance on praise can hinder risk-taking and innovation. High achievers often become accustomed to positive feedback, which can prevent them from making bold career moves or engaging in innovative work. 2. Distinguishing the inner critic from realistic thinking. The inner critic is repetitive, black and white, and harsh, often sounding like a broken record. In contrast, realistic thinking is forward-moving, generative, and curious. It seeks solutions and is kinder in tone. 3. Naming and noticing the inner critic. When you recognize the inner critic, name it and acknowledge its presence. This helps to distance yourself from its influence and understand its underlying motives, often related to safety and emotional protection. 4. Allowing the inner critic to be present. It's important to allow the inner critic to exist without letting it control your actions. For example, Moore wrote an article despite her inner critic's doubts, which eventually got published successfully. 5. Managing others' inner critics. When dealing with employees or colleagues with overactive inner critics, avoid arguing with their self-doubt. Instead, initiate conversations that acknowledge their feelings and share your own experiences with self-doubt. This helps them see their inner critic's irrationality and encourages skill development in managing self-doubt. 6. Open conversations about the inner critic. Encourage open discussions about the inner critic in professional settings to help individuals recognize and manage their self-doubt, fostering higher potential and better communication. This chapter also suggests several practical advice. 1. Reflect on praise. Reevaluate your relationship with praise and consider if it is limiting your growth or preventing you from taking necessary risks. 2. Identify the tone. Learn to distinguish the critical, repetitive tone of the inner critic from the constructive, solution-focused voice of realistic thinking. 3. Acknowledge fears. Understand that the inner critic's warnings are often rooted in fear of failure, rejection, or emotional discomfort. Recognizing this can help you navigate these fears more effectively. 4. Encourage transparency. Foster an environment where discussing self-doubt and inner critics is normalized, helping others manage their fears and maximize their potential. By applying these strategies, individuals can better manage their inner critics, allowing for greater personal and professional growth, creativity, and fulfillment.
Summary of Chapter 17 Being a Parent Made Me a Better Manager, and Vice Versa, by Yelena Zikik. Over the past decade or so, workplace discussions have increasingly focused on work-life balance, creating more humane and compassionate work environments, and finding passion and meaning in work. However, there seems to be a disconnect between these principles and our personal lives. Often, the skills we develop at work in prioritizing, communicating, and managing conflicts are left at the office, and the patience and empathy we cultivate at home are not carried into our professional lives. This separation is seen as inefficient, especially by parents who recognize that the abilities honed in parenting are valuable and should be applied at work, and vice versa. This chapter shows three skills that learned from parenting. 1. Adapting to change. Dealing with this routine chaos makes us better at creating our own dynamic capabilities. Raising children teaches us how to become more adaptive to change, to cope with change while learning from it. 2. Respecting psychological safety as a universal human need. The more we're able to create a positive, open family environment, the stronger our relationships with our children become. The more open and psychologically safe our team environment is, the better our team dynamics will be. 3. Self-reflecting and continually improving. Like leadership coaches, parenting experts would encourage us not only to question our parenting approaches but also to learn from our mistakes and our children's feedback. This book will help restore your confidence and get you moving forward. Communicate better with everyone is your guide to taking all the communication skills and experience you already have and tweaking them to fit your career plus caregiving reality. In the chapters that follow, you'll get the perspective, practical strategies, and actual wording you need to tackle the toughest working parent conversations, authentically and effectively without undue stress. This isn't a communications primer or 101 course, actually, it's the reverse. It focuses only on the trickier and more loaded working parent interactions, the conversations that, even as a skilled negotiator and veteran parent, you don't feel as confident about and that no communications course would get into. And it unpacks those conversations at a deeper level, right where your ambition bumps up against who you are as a loving parent.